Hey everybody, this is Chris from Dover, Delaware. And I'm Mel from Marydale, Delaware. And we are here talking about the whole armor of God. So, like I was saying earlier, um, recently I've been, you know, kind of thinking about different topics and, and just praying about, you know, what topics I should pursue. And, um, you know, just, you know, one time while I was praying, I was just asking God to you know, put a different topic on my mind so I could start, you know, diving into it a little bit more. And um, the topic that has been consistent throughout this whole week is uh, the whole armor of God. And I think hmm. it's mostly, it mostly has to do with the fact that I don't know that I can remember off the top of my head the last sermon that I heard about the armor. Um, in fact, if I were to think back hard enough, we'd probably be going back into my childhood into like a Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like it's it's something that is extremely, I don't even think the underrated is really the right word for it because I just think. It's not rated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think it's, I think it's more than just not rated. It's just like people don't focus on it. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's not, you know, everybody wants to know, you know, in this, this world that we live in, everything's quick, you know, how mm. do I solve this problem or do this or do that? Or, you know, what's the cure or what's the result? But nobody really wants to admit that we're at war. Mm. And those who do admit that we're at war, there's two camps, right? There's the ones that are hardcore, you know, let's get after it, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Go all militant into it, you know, spiritual warfare. Let's go. Almost like they're coming into it because they love warfare already. And this is a, another way to engage in the topic, essentially. Right. And then the other camp is basically like, oh, well, I don't, I don't believe in warfare. So I'm just going to ignore it and it'll mm. go away, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, God will handle it. And trying to essentially tr the opposite, which would be avoiding conflict. Like people right. who, people who tend to avoid conflict. Right. So there's this um, <clears throat> there's this quote, and I don't remember the quote off the top of my head. I wish, I, I wish I'd been more prepared and come with it. It's basically a question like, would you rather be a gardener at war or would you rather be a warrior in a garden? Hmm. Okay, yeah. So hearing that, what would you rather be? Like knee-jerk reaction would be, I'd rather be a warrior in a garden. Um I think it's probably just because, I mean, <laughs> certainly some of it might be because of the whole masculinity thing, you know, being a, um, a man and liking the idea of the warrior. But I think more to it, I, I like the idea of the, um, you, can, you get kind of a picture of preparedness with a warrior in a garden, you know, he's, you're living a life of peace, but ready for action, essentially. Yeah, I, I kind of view it the same way. Um you know, I look at it from the perspective of, you know, when do you, when do you see a warrior in a garden during peace? Mm -hmm. When do you see a gardener at war when it's too late? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you know, so I kind of look at it from that perspective of, you know, maybe I, I'd rather be default aggressive in that manner. I'd rather be that warrior in the garden mm. because... In my mind, if if I'm in a literal garden and I see a bunch of bad dudes, like some hardcore Marines or SEALs or something, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to be like, yo, we're good. Right. Everything's good. But if I were in like a wartime exercise and I've got like my battle buddy is like this most geeky green thumb looking dude. <laughs> and I'm not saying they're all like that. I'm not saying that at all. Oh, no. But, you know, if I've got somebody who just doesn't want to be there, and I don't, I don't know that anybody wants to be at war, but, right, you know, that's going to elicit more fear than anything, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's an element of, uh, oh, I'm not going to be able to think of the word now, um, uh, unpreparedness, mm -hmm. but an instability, I suppose, would be a good word for it. Right. Yeah. Let's kind of, what, what is 
the armor of God to you. We're, we're going to be diving into Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Um, and we're going to be going through a couple other um, books and chapters and verses that tie into that. But our main focus is going to be Ephesians. Um, what in your mind is the armor of God? <clears throat> Uh, well, the, the way that I've always kind of seen it would be the armor of God is, uh, I'm going to have to be careful here when I say this, I guess, I, I guess I've always more seen it as a, as a mentality um, more than anything. So, I mean, we have the elements here that are actual armor, but if you look at what they're tied to, um, they're more like, well, many of them are more like the gifts or the fruit of the Spirit. And if we look at the fruit of the spirit, that is, you know, a description of a, of a mentality. It's it's being um, of the spirit versus being of the flesh, which is two different ways of thinking. You know, Paul tells us in in First uh, Corinthians, <coughs> or sorry, Romans chapter twelve, that we are to be we are to renew our minds, mm. and you know that's that's what we're talking about when we're, ta- when when we're talking about. Um, walking in the spirit it's a it's a different mentality a new mindset a new way of thinking so when i think of the armor of god um i think of a of a mentality yeah i I agree i think it's i think the armor is more of a mindset at least the way that i read through the scripture it's definitely a mindset a um a place of preparedness Mm. A place of um, ready, mm-hmm. you know, battle ready, mm-hmm. um, and and it also, you know, I'm I'm very much a why person, you know. Yeah. Going through this, it talks a lot about the why, um, yes. which is perfect for me. Um, <laughs> but um, so we're gonna start in Ephesians six, uh, ten through twenty. So ten. In the ESV version says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Right. So for somebody who's a new Christian, how could they read that and say, you know, what does that mean? Good question. Yeah. Okay, because this is coming at the end. So this is the end of Ephesians, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing we have after this is the like the final greetings and Paul's instruct personal instructions on um, how he would like those who are receiving the letter to uh, react. <clears throat> but this is the final teaching, uh, essentially, of Ephesians. So we're at the end. Um, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Um, if we read further, we understand that he's addressing the the end times. He's addressing mm-hmm. um, what he calls the evil day, and that's this. It's it's addressing this war, this idea of warfare, Christian warfare or spiritual warfare, um, and the the idea that they are they are being attacked. Um, the warning or the the benediction here given in verse ten is saying, "Be strong." So in other words, prepare yourself, mm-hmm. be ready. Um, and so, that, I mean, that's that's what we're getting here. And, and the, at least from this, just verse ten here, that's what we're getting. Um, I'm not really aware personally of any other ways of looking at it, but I am one person. So <laughs> um, don't don't count that as the the end. Well, I like the way that Second uh, Timothy two one kind of says the same thing, but a little bit different. It says, "You then, my child, be strengthened." By the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Mm. And I look at that because I believe that I'm a child of God. Yes. And when I think about my children, you know, my children are fearful of things. And I look at those things and I'm like, why are you even afraid of this? Like, <laughs> what's the point? Perspective. Right. And yeah. it, it's, it's easy for us as parents to look at that and say, like, that is not a concern whatsoever. Mm. But do our kids actually listen to it? Does it help them when we tell them, like, stop being afraid? You're being a little punk. <laughs> <laughs> like, probably I, not. <laughs> yeah, only, well, at least, at least uh, if it does help, it's, it's usually only do it to a certain degree. Right. Yeah. So in this way, you know, God's telling us, like, hey, 
I've got it. I'm your strength. I know that this is minuscule in the grand scheme of things. Mm. And so for me, it's somewhat of a promise or a reassurance and saying like, hey, you're going through this time right now. You don't have to be strong because you're strong yes. in me. As my child, I give you strength. Yes. And so that has ties then back to the, a lot of the Old Testament teachings as well as we're talking about, um, you know, the Lord being our shelter, and mm-hmm. our shield. Um, and uh, I even brings to my mind Proverbs 3 where it talks about not trusting in your own understanding, you know, but you know, instead uh, trusting in God fully because we, you know, that's, that's our tendency. The same thing with your know, illustration with kids. It's a tendency for them to rely on them their own abilities and strength when they're so limited. Um, and, and yet we as parents then are, especially, you know, I, I think of this as a father, um, we're there to give them comfort and security in that we are stronger than them. We are able to help them. We're able to see more clearly than they can, and, and they can rely on that. They can rest in that. Mm. And in that same way, you know, we are called to, um, I mean, that's that's how we experience our lives as Christians. We're God's children. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even, even the wisest among us is still a fool compared to God. You know, we, we still don't have a, a fraction of it figured out. And there are things that we will never be able to figure out because of our constrictions of being human. Um, but he has, and he, he knows all things, he understands all things, and he has He's, he's omnipotent. He has all power, and we can rely on that. We can rest in that. We can find our strength in, in his might. I, I think, um, <clears throat> you, you know, part of when I read this, you can look to the why. You know, like I asked before, like how can a new believer um, or even a non-believer, you know, look at that and say, okay, what is what does that mean, strength and might? And, and I'm reminded of uh, previously in Ephesians uh, chapter 119 where it says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. So literally the way that I'm looking at this is you don't have to do anything but to believe mm. in him and his power. And you have that, right? You have that afforded to you. Right. And, and I can't think of, I, I apologize. You probably remember the uh, the scripture verse that talks about the the faith of a mustard seed. Yes, yeah, it's um and Matthew, I believe, in a couple of the gospels yeah. where Jesus gives the, uh, the illustration of the mustard seed. Yeah. So, it, it's interesting to me that you know if you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's extraordinarily small, mm. and that's literally all the faith and the belief that we have to put into it. Yes. But if we're not equipped with the tools or the strength to deal with it then really how much faith are we putting into it? How much belief are we putting into it? Hmm. Yeah, okay. Does that make sense? I, I think so. I think I get what you're saying here. Um, so when my mind takes it is, uh, so we talked about the faith of a mustard seed. There's a lot of people have problems with that. They're like, okay, if all that we need is the faith, faith the size of a mustard seed in order to do these great and wonderful things when... Um, why then do we have all these other verses that talk about increasing our faith uh-huh. um, and growing in faith? And uh, the way that I've seen it or been able to interpret it anyway would be that in, if you look at it, um, we are we are told through Scripture that our salvation is based in faith and it is not in works, okay? Um, and, you know, of course, there's... <laughs> tons of debates on that and, you know, how that fleshes out and what exactly that looks like um, with people landing on just everywhere in the spectrum, I guess you could put it. Um, But in reality, I mean, if you really dig through the scriptures and and search, you'll find that all that is required of us is, like you were saying, to believe Mm -hmm. for salvation. Our salvation is completely dependent on one thing, and it is that we accept it. That's it. Yeah, that's and that's minimal. Yeah, and I think that's kind Bare of minimal. I think that's kind of where we're getting. And, and literally, the only reason that that's even required is because if we didn't have to accept it, then it would literally just be forced on us, mm. and that's not what God intended. That's not what He desires. That's not love. Right. 
you know, um, and love doesn't force itself on anyone. And so that's just the bare minimum. And that's all that's required of us on our part for salvation. Now, what happens after salvation is a totally different story. And that's where people get wrapped up is this, you know, after salvation comes, um, then we're called, we have Jesus' commandments. You know, we have uh, Jesus' teachings and, and so forth where he's saying, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm. Um, and you'll find where, you know, James teaches on, uh, if you have faith without works, then you're, it's it's not faith. Yeah, It's dead. <laughs> Essentially, it's um, in Ephesians, in the same book where uh, Paul talks about, he says that, um, it is by faith that you're, we're saved and not by works. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the grace of God. But he says, but we were, we were saved just after that. It, we, were, we were saved for good works. Right. It was so that after we're saved, there are works, there are good works that God wants us to do. Um, and those works don't save us by any stretch of imagination. You know, elsewhere Paul, Paul talks about, he says, like, um, we will all stand before the judgment seat of, of God, saved, unsaved, everyone. And those who are saved are also going to be judged based on how they lived. Yeah. And if you do, you know, just don't do anything after you're saved for the rest of your life, you still believe in Jesus as your Savior. You still trust in him. Um, you've ex- you accept his salvation, but you do nothing else. You're just, I don't know, you're, you're paralyzed by fear, what, whatever it may be. You end up standing before God at the end of your life, and you have nothing except for that foundation that Jesus laid, which is your salvation. It says we're all going to be tried by fire, and whatever remains after the fire comes and burns through our life is going to be for God's glory Mm. and for ours, but ultimately for God's glory. Versus if you did nothing, you're still saved, but only as if by escaping through the fire, with the words that he uses. You know, it's like, essentially, you made it by the skin of your teeth. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you're you there, but, like, man, really? Like, yeah, the tie goes to the runner. <laughs> you couldn't do just a little more? Like, <laughs> you know, and, and, and this is where we kind of, you know, as people start getting into the deep end of, like, the different degrees of heaven, you know, the Mormons, which they, you know, get it from a, a different scripture, but... Um, and there's this idea of different degrees of heaven, and, and we don't need to get into that today. <laughs> but the point is, um, getting back to the main point here, faith, um, all we need to start with is a mustard seed. Just being like, yes, I believe Jesus is Savior. I believe he's God. I believe he came, and he made a way for, for me to, to have a relationship with God again and, and to um, ex- to inherit eternal life. After that, though, we should be increasing in faith. Um, and, you know, and Paul elsewhere talks about, uh, well, elsewhere, I say elsewhere, it's in 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about, um, you know, even if we have faith to be able to say to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, you know, you talk about that kind of faith. Now, that's that's major faith. That's, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's the last time I, you I saw someone make saw a mountain it. jump. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, so that's huge faith. Um which again, you know, the point of that was like, but you don't have love, then you have nothing. So again, he's he's pointing back to love, um, which is critical. But still, he's showing he's giving us an illustration of greater faith than that mustard seed that we begin with. So we should um, be expecting to see growth in faith as Christians as we, as we grow up. <clears throat> and I think, and most of that is in this. Like um, Peter tells us in First Peter, he says, you know, we've been given his. His promises, the promises of God, which are able to do all of the work of sanctification in our lives. Mm. The only thing is that we have to believe those things. If we are given the promises of God, but we don't believe them, then how can we expect them to do anything in our lives? And that's where James comes in. He says, you can say that you believe, but if you do, if it doesn't produce action in your life, then it's not real belief. You don't really believe it. You mm. just like to believe it. Yeah. You'd like to think you believe it. like the idea. Yeah, you like the idea of it, but you don't really you haven't staked your life on it. Mm. Like you haven't stepped off the edge, um, so to speak, you know, metaphorically. Yeah. But, you know, that's this idea of, that's the faith. That's, you know, that's rubber meeting the road. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of idea, you know, where we, even this here, where we're talking about, um, you know, we, we're, we're speaking about being strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Um, how do we do that? It's, it's like you were saying, faith. But we and where did, how does that look? How does that work? Well, it's just us trusting what he's told us. And what he's told us is 
that he will be with us yeah. and that he will be our strength. He will be our shield, our tower of refuge. Do we believe that? Do we trust it? Can we, do we stake our lives on that? And then there we are. Well, I, I think we almost, we almost have to, because as we go into, um, the, the next verse of, uh, Ephesians 6, uh, 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Mm. You know, it's almost saying <laughs> like, Hey, you know, in 10, it's like, Hey, you're not going to be able to do this without me yeah. type thing. But Hey, here, here's what, what you can do. You can yeah. put on the whole armor of God. Yes. You know, and you know, what is the whole armor of God? If we go, if we skip ahead to, um, you know, verse 14, where it stands, it says, uh, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it even talks about it in Job 29, 14. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice is like a robe and a, uh, a turban. Mm. You know, and it's, it's, and this, this is something that occurs all throughout, like Old Testament and New Testament. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Being clothed in righteousness. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely um, a reoccurring theme. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, we're found, of course, what is what is that righteousness? You know, then what is this this idea of the righteousness or putting on righteousness? Um, is it our own righteousness? Is it that we become better? Or is, it, is this righteousness this idea of us, you know, becoming better, having our own righteousness, or, or is it something else? Well, and I think it's interesting that they mention um, the belt of truth first, because I think everything yeah. is seated within the truth. Yes, like you, you can't move forward without that truth. We think of the gospel of truth, right? Right. I mean, it's it's we're, we're given the gospel of truth, the message, the good news of truth. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, "I am the the way, the truth, and the life." life. Yeah. Um, and even if you were to take this a little bit further, like you get into the uh, the realm of philosophy, um, you know, you still you have this idea, this principle of truth, um, and what is truth? Uh, but ultimately, how do you define truth? If you know, I mean, this is one of the one of the ways that you could go about, you know, proving God's existence. Mm. Although I don't know if truth is a great way to go about it, because you could always argue against truth, but. Um, as essentially, though, if we have a principle of truth, then what is truth? Well, the well, truth is God. Mm. Truth, or truth, at, li- at the very least, is whatever God says. Or if you know, if there is a God, um, then there is a high God, and whatever He says should be true. If there's a perfect being, then whatever they say must be true. So we have this idea of truth. Um, and, and the Bible here has it has it here like you were saying. It's one of the first things that we put on. It's the, the belt of, belt of truth, and there's there's importance to that is because everything that we receive has to be the truth. If it's not the truth, then it's. I mean, I mean, categorically, you could put it here. You know, we just we just talked about you know, in verse eleven, it says to put on the full armor of God so that we would be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You know, if you really look into that, we're we're looking at like schemes being entrapments, um, plans, uh, usually deceive or deception, or lies. Right? This is a um, we know that Satan is the the father of all lies. You see that a lot in you know this day and age with you know fact checkers and different news <laughs> yeah. sources or different people saying yeah. things that you know, maybe half, tr- half truths or quarter truths. And, yes. You know, they're passing it on as if it's, you know, full gospel, you know, yes. truth. And it's, yeah. you, you know, it, it is difficult mm. sometimes to tell. Mm. And, you know, I look at it as if like, you know, is, is this information rooted in biblical truth? Is it rooted in God? And right. if it's not, I have to be skeptical of it. Right. And that is an excellent foundation. Um, and for Christians, I feel like that's, that should be common sense for us, you know. Mm-hmm. So we, we're if we're in pursuit of truth, then we're in pursuit of of God. We're in pursuit of whatever God has said, and that's through His Word. Right. Um, now, again, if someone would be listening to this and they're not Christians, you know, or they're maybe struggling with this idea of uh, the the veracity of the God or of Scripture, or in other words, if God's Word is true, fully true, then you know that that's a a totally different. Topic. It's a deeper dive, and we can get into that. You know, is the Bible true? 
Um, but yes, for us as, as Christians, you know, if you've done our due diligence and understand um, the the veracity of the scriptures, the the um, the way that God has given us His Word as truth, then yeah, I mean, we're going to God's Word. We're going here for uh, for truth. And and again, like this idea of of that first step being truth is important because if you base anything on a lie, it's all going to come crashing down. You know, and that can't last. Um, so everything that we do should be based off of or founded on truth, which is, again, the idea of, you know, elsewhere it says that uh, Paul talks about Jesus being our, our foundation. And what is Jesus? You know, he's, he's the truth. Our foundation is, is in the truth. And from there, we should continue to build on the truth. Well, it, it's always interested me from the standpoint of, you know, armor of God. Right. Like it, it, if you're putting armor on, that means you're going to war. Yes. You know, like I work in law enforcement, so I wear a bulletproof vest. You know, right. I, I have body armor that I wear. Breastplate. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Right. Like I don't, I don't go into battle without that. Right. Um, I need that protection. Right. But what does that mean in the spiritual realm? And I love how second Corinthians 10, four says for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine Ooh. power to destroy strongholds. Oh Yeah. That's one of my favorite passages. Yeah, when we when you're talking about spiritual warfare, the the armor of God. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. And yes. it's it's just you know to me it, it 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 makes a lot of sense to me when I go to work I put that vest on because I want to come home at the end of the day, right? right? Right. So if I'm going out into the world and I am and I'm going out to fight these uh, demons that are attacking my strongholds, you know, why wouldn't I put on the armor of God? And I think for me personally, it's because I don't truly, or I've, I have not been equipped enough throughout the years to truly understand what that means. So in other words, you haven't put on the belt of truth. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm putting it on. I'm figuring out how to buckle it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a great, that's, that's an excellent example. Like, that's that's exactly what we're dealing with here. And again, it shows the wisdom of God's word here. Like, there's, a, there's an order and there's a perfection in the way that God presents things. You know, we, we tend, as humans, again, it's like we're kids, you know, we read these things in scriptures and, and we just automatically assume we understand, like... We're just, we're the pinnacle mm-hmm. of knowledge. We're the bee's knees. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've got it figured yeah. out. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yes. It's like every teenager ever <laughs> in history. <laughs> it's like, I know it all. Yes, exactly. And that's what we are. Yeah. You know, very, very often that's what we are as as God's children, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, we come across these things and we're just like, oh, yeah, like, you know, that's, that's cute. You know, that's, that's a neat way of putting things. How quaint, God! Like, look at you. Yeah. Uh, but we don't understand. Like, he's he's literally given us everything that we need. Like these words, they are inspired. These are God's words. He has a purpose and an order. There's again, just like you said before, there's a reason He gives us the belt of truth mm-hmm. first. Yeah. Because if we don't have that belt of truth, then the rest of it is no, kind of it. pointless. Yeah. <laughs> if we don't have that that belt of truth, then we can be convinced that we don't need it. The breastplate. There's no war. There's there isn't no. Yeah, there's no not. like in in our minds. There's no war. We're just there's, sheep. You know, Satan, he's he's winning. Yeah, <laughs> his fiery darts are penetrating us left and right. You know, there's no reason for us to fight back. We're not fighting back. That's the point. You know, and, and that he ends, he opens this. You know, says, "Be prepared. Like, mm-hmm. um, put on the full armor of God so that you can withstand. Yeah, so that you will live. Like, come on, <laughs> stand by to get some because it's here. Yeah. It's coming. It's it's already here. It's happening. You just need to get yourself ready. Like, get out there. Come on, get yourself ready. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I think for me, the reason why the, diving into this is so important is because. You know, it, it, it's laid out perfectly, I think, in Ephesians 4.14, where it says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro yes. by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, mm. by human cunning, yes. by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Like, to me, it's it's so easy to grow up. I remember when I was at Bible college, um, I remember 
going into a biblical interpretation class and hearing the professor tell me something that directly contradicted what I grew up understanding. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself, like, that's not true. Miss so-and-so from Sunday school (laughs) back in the day said it means this. Yes. Right? Yes. And like, but, but clearly there's more to understand right than just what meets the surface so well and yeah i mean i do you know it really comes down to do we really think that we heard it right the first time yeah. <laughs> like, or that we truly understood as a child even yeah, yeah even if it was the right information that we really grasped it right the first time yeah that's you know it's kind of a really naive way of thinking but it is again this, that's how we think very yeah. often you know we don't we don't challenge ourselves we don't really i mean really what it comes down i feel like we don't are we really pursuing yeah. You know, are and we pursuing that that's the key for me is the pursuit because it's so easy to just go to church on Sunday mm. and listen to what the pastor's telling you. Yeah. And walk out the door and not think twice about it until the very next week. Yeah. And then you're back doing the same thing, you get into this rut. So for me it's more like, okay, I hear what people have said, what people are saying, but I want to dive into this. Yeah. And what does it mean for me? Yeah. I I mean, yeah. Amen. (laughs) So what what does this mean for my relationship? Because it should be my relationship with God. 100%. You know, I mean, we're a community, no no doubt. I mean, we're individuals. We're still individuals. You know, we, we, you know, we operate as a community. We're called to operate as a community. We, we gather, um, we, we fellowship and commune, but each and every one, and this is taught all through Scripture, each and every one of us is accountable for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Each and every one of us will stand before God ourselves. Yeah. So this should be my relationship. Yeah, you're not you're not talking for me. <laughs> We're not going to be standing next <laughs> no. to God and he, you, you ta- talking for me. That's no exactly mouthpiece right. there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ephesians 6, uh, 12. Uh, hmm. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authority, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Yes. I, see, you jumped right from verse 11 to 14, and I was terrified. <laughs> Not terrified, but I was wondering. I was going to ask you, are we going to go back oh, to, yeah. the, no, no, yeah. to what we're fighting against? Because <laughs> like, those are pretty important verses. Very important. Um, which, again, uh, I mean, every one of these things could be a full two-hour discussion easy um we're talking about truth we're talking about you know all these different aspects like we could easy go forever on these topics on individual topics um and it's the same thing for verse 12 um like that's that's huge um again in our human minds we read these words and we're like yeah yeah of course of course yeah yeah, 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 i've heard that a thousand times of course of course you know just you know brush right past it but in reality like this is profound this is huge, um, and and a lot of Christians struggle with this. Like, what 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 does it even mean? Because we're from a community of mostly pacifists, <laughs> so so especially um, for for like our community uh, who really strongly hold on to pacifism, uh, we really struggle with this idea of warfare to begin with. Because we're like, well, we're not in, we're not, we're pacifists. We don't fight. Yeah. We don't, you know, let nah. let whoever do whatever they want. You know, it's exactly what the <laughs> devil wants. Yeah, right. They want but people we, like us. And then even, but even in in like you know your uh, like pop Christianity, the this verse is a little bit difficult because I mean we have all these other teachings that tell us that we should live in peace with all men as much as possible. That we're supposed to pray for our leaders. We're supposed to subject ourselves to leaders, mm-hmm. to authorities. Mm-hmm. Um, but then here you have a verse telling us that we're fighting authorities. Mm-hmm. What does this mean? Which well, is it? And, and I think that's that's <clears throat> where the belt of truth comes in. Yeah. And to know which authorities are speaking truths. Mm, yeah. You know, we, we we can all, no matter where our walk of life is, we've all known those people that as soon as they start talking, we know it's just lip service. It's garbage. <laughs> like, they probably don't even believe what they're saying. <laughs> no. But they're hoping to try to convince Politicians. us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, um, but I think... I think that the more connected we are to truth, the easier it is to see that and the easier it is to fight against that. Yes. But at the same time, we are called to submit also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But submit what? It's a good question. <laughs> That's where we're getting into. So what is the, what is the truth? 
what is this truth we're putting around our waists? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's this, is, this is real. Like, this is very much what we struggle with, as Christians at least. Um, although I'm sure this is, I mean, these things t- touch truths that are pretty near universal, so there are m- many people struggle with this, whether they're Christians or not. Um, yeah, where, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line of, of um, submission? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think that God or the Holy Spirit can work within those people? Within? People who are um, dark spiritual forces. Oh, if he can work within the spirit, the essentially the enemies listed here in verse 12. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I would have to ask what you, like how you define within. So in, in Ephesians 2.2, 2, it states, um, in which you once walked, follow the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Yes. Okay. So, all right. So I, I guess, I think I know what you're saying here. Um, so this, I mean, that verse right there was talking about us formerly being in the darkness. So it's right. like our past as Christians. Again, this is referring to Christians specifically now. Um, as Christians, we once were in the dark, now we're in the light. We're, we're in the kingdom of darkness, now we're in the kingdom of light. Um, and while we were in the kingdom of darkness, we were enslaved, essentially, to the, the, the prince. How did that, that, the prince of darkness? Was it that? Uh, forces of evil. Forces of evil. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, same idea, like this idea that we were under subjugation of this evil power. Um, so that was what was working in us. That's all we knew. I mean, in the darkness, that's all you know is darkness. Um, and and we had no power over that. <clears throat> now, at some point, if, if you end up becoming a Christian, there's this transference from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And so, the, the light had to come, right? Like, at, at some point, like, we're talking about the light, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, God... He had to come and do something mm-hmm. within us in order to draw us, because no one comes to God unless they're first drawn by the Spirit or drawn by God. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is idea that we were okay. So we were in the the kingdom of darkness, and we were brought in. We were transferred is actually how it words it into the kingdom of of light. And so that's not our action. That's not our work. That is the work of the Spirit. That's the work of God. And so He did. <clears throat> he must be able to go into there, go into, and this is again, this is all um, metaphysical, or not metaphysical, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not literal, okay, but still there's this idea that there, there has to be something that happens where he comes into the darkness and brings us out of it. And I think we've see, we see the perfect example of that in Jesus. He came, he, uh, he literally died, and was... Um, Taken down into the earth is how the Bible describes it. So he goes, and, and many people would say that he, I mean, it's, a, it's again, this is a debate, and it's not, um, I'm not an expert on this, but it's a, man, many people would say that he went down into Sheol or death, death itself. Um, so this idea that he went into the darkness, and then he came back out of the darkness. And that's where our hope comes in. This resurrection, this idea of the resurrection, that Jesus rose again from the dead, that is our hope. That is, that is where we find our hope. Uh, Paul says if, if it wasn't for the resurrection, of all people, us Christians would be the most miserable ones. Because it's true. what is the actual point? <laughs> like, there is none. If, if Jesus hadn't rose from the dead, I wouldn't be a Christian. <laughs> I mean, what's the point? Because there's no hope. There's no, there's no reason, necessarily. Um so yeah, I mean that's we're looking at Jesus of going into going into the darkness and coming back out of it. So again, getting back to your main question, I would say um, I don't I don't know if I would go as as far as to say that God is able to work um, through the darkness. I don't know. I do know that He uses what the enemy intends for evil for good. So He's able to take what the enemy produces and turn it into good. Um, does that mean that he is guiding the enemy? I, maybe, I don't know. I don't, I don't pretend to know God that well. Um, there are things about God that I think we were never, we're never going to understand, uh, because we can't. He is by nature, uh, incomprehensible. 
Uh, but at the same time, okay, so I would say that he does work. He can do work within the darkness because uh, he comes in and he, I mean, Jesus came in into the darkness and, and then um, was able to, to leave the darkness again. Um, <laughs> and he did a lot more than just that. Um, but it, yeah, I would say he's able to work within the darkness. He's able to take what the gar- darkness produces and turn it in, into light. Um. Yeah, and I think that's enough. I don't know. No, I, I would agree. I, and I think that, you know, Colossians one thirteen kind of puts it into perspective. Um, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and yes. transferred us that's, into the kingdom of his dear son. You got the verse I was quoting. Look, we have a reference. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it says it perfectly right there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and um, if you go, if we go back into Ephesians uh, yeah. chapter 310 it says um, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known uh, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places yes yeah um, you know and, and even further back in Ephesians 1 3 you know blessed be to God and father of our land of our Lord Jesus Christ excuse me who has blessed us in Christ in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You know, it, 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 to me that, you know, just kind of says like, Hey, um, you know, when we're up against the enemy, there's really only, you know, one person that you can really thank for all this. Oh yeah. You know, there, there's only one person that can, come into the pits of hell to get us out, you know, yeah. per se. You oh, know, yeah. when we're in, you know, like a deep, deep, dark depression, a deep, or as they say, like a dark place in our lives. Yeah, it's almost like no matter how you would define that darkness, like no matter what definition you give the darkness, um, Jesus is able to overcome it. Like he, it, it applies to every darkness. 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that. I agree. I mean, that's 100% what we're... Um, yeah, that, that's what this is talking. That's what we're dealing with here. We're talking. We're talking about um, if we're talking about salvation. If we're talking about you know we're getting into truth, uh, the armor of God, um, light versus darkness. <laughs> As Christians, I mean, and, and even if you were to take it outside of Christianity and just uh, um, just life in general. Yeah, I, I mean, just the principles because this is what we're dealing with here. Are there are principles? They're they're universal truths here. I agree. Which are principles. Um, and I think that I'm not to detract from the specific words used here, the specific message, because I think that's incredibly important. But even if you take this into abstract and you deal with principles, um, Jesus is it. Yeah. I mean, it sounds so cliche, but it, it just it's just always the same. Yeah, it was the same then, the same today, and the same yeah. tomorrow. He did it all. He literally did it all. And that's, I mean, that's the message. That's the gospel. That's... That's this truth that we're putting on. That's this strength that we find in God. Yeah. Is that it's already done. The war is already won. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, but again, you know, coming back from that. Doesn't mean that we're not fighting. We're still in the battle. We're still fighting. We're We're still still in in the trenches. Yeah, God exists outside of time and space, and so he, you know, the war is already won, sure. But we're here. We are in time and space. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're human. We're physical. And it's it's right now it's real. So, um, you know there are still things that we need to do, but mostly the things that we need to do. I, I mean, they keep coming down to back to the same things, which is just to believe. Mm-hmm. Like just okay. So, uh, and but then again, you you ask the question: How can you believe? Like Paul says, how can you believe if you haven't heard? Mm-hmm. So first, you need to hear. Yeah. You need to you need to be pursuing, um, the truth. You need to be pursuing the truth of Jesus Himself. Um, God, you need to be pursuing God, and how do you do that? I mean, you pick. <laughs> just, yeah. just do it. Dive into it. <laughs> just do it. Yeah. I mean, do you pursue God through podcasts like this? Do you pursue God through uh, His Word? Do you pursue God through prayer? Do you pursue God through experiences? Do you pursue God through work? Even um, you pursue God. I mean, I, there are, there's a myriad of ways that you could pursue God, but but are you? But are we, like, am I, am I pursuing God? Or am I pursuing I'm just my own, my own intellect, my own, you know, 
uh, I mean, the whole Bible puts it around kingdom. Um, but it's essentially just, am I, do I have selfish ambition? Is it just selfishness that I'm after? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that there's a difference between, um, there, well, there's a, there's a quote, don't listen to hear, listen to understand. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times in life, we will listen to somebody without the intent to understand. We listen yeah. from the perspective of, oh, well, you know, they're rambling on about something. I don't care. I just need to listen to them so they'll go away type thing. Or even, I mean, I mean, getting back to a little bit of, well, I was talking about self, selfish ambition. Uh, uh, what I hear when you say listening to hear, it's just essentially you're, I mean, it could be a checkbox, but uh, it's essentially you're listening to to make it look like you're hearing. Right. To to look it's, good, it's fake. Yeah, you're just you just wanna you wanna make yourself look good or feel good, right. or what have you. Yeah, but you're but not when, actually trying to gain understanding. Right. When you're listening to understand, that's where it comes in, and I think mm. I think ego plays a huge role in that. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> what does ego have anything to do with anything? <laughs> yeah, ego never hurt anybody. Right? What do we know about ego? Oh, someone didn't put on the belt of truth. <laughs> 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 but in anyways, you know, we we talk about, you know, um, spiritual warfare and, and spiritual forces and the ev- evil in the heavenly places. Um, you know, and that takes us right into um, verse 13, mm-hmm. where it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Yeah. And having done all to withstand or to stand firm. Yes. So there's the why. Yeah. Why do we put on the armor of God? Yeah, it's kind of restating what he says in verse 11, I believe, right? right. So he has a verse 11, which is almost the same. And then he has verse 12, where he talks about the enemy. And then he comes back again. So it's like he's saying... He's reaffirming it. He, he is. He's reaffirming. He's reestablishing the importance of it, really. Um, because you have, you know, the verse 10, which says, you know, um, put on the armor of God. You know, Or it says, finally be strong, right? And so he's saying... You know, he's preparing. He said, get ready. You know, get yourself together. And then he says, put on the armor of God. This is how you're going to get yourself together. Put on the armor of God. Why? Because there's the enemy and he's trying to, he's trying to get you. He's got his evil schemes that he's trying, he's, he's employing. And then he goes into the enemy. So he really gets into the why. Yeah. Like really gets into like who we're fighting. And so like, as you get this picture of who we're fighting, it's, it's, it's pretty big. Like this is, it's, I think vague and vague for a reason mm-hmm. because it, it sets up this grand array of enemies of like these supernatural enemies that you can't even see they're operating in the shadows they're like in power they're high up yep. you know they're they're outside of your realm and you know that's that's intimidating yeah it and seems I think, untouchable yeah exactly and for a reason and then he comes back in verse 13 he's like look again this is why yeah don't take this lightly yeah. don't don't miss this like, no and and I think you just hit the nail on the head because if you look at ephesians five sixteen it says making making the best use of the time because mm. the days are evil like yeah. we're in <clears throat> the evil times right now, yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah, I mean that's now is there eviler times to come <laughs> y- yeah <laughs> yeah, the debate is there <laughs> I don't know that there's much debate, but yeah, hundred percent we are not in good times right, right now, right, but it's it's basically I th- I feel like he's coming back and restating it because there's not much time. The time's now. Right. It's time to strap on right. the armor of God and get to work. Yes. And and Paul, I mean he he's doing, he cares. Paul cr- cares greatly. And Paul Paul sometimes gets a bad rap of being like this overly zealous, overly zealous just kind of like He was the, the first youth pastor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the first time I heard it like yeah. that. But, I mean, in a lot of ways, yeah. yeah. And, and, like, some people struggle to take him seriously because he says a lot of controversial things. Yeah. He's, like, just bold, brash. like yeah. and, and he's a little, like, he can come across, if you don't understand him, he can come across as a little arrogant <laughs> you know, from time to time. Although, I mean, again, if you really look at it and you really um, dig into it, which, again, is here where I'm getting to, mm-hmm you get into it it's be, the only reason he comes across that way is because he really genuinely cares 100% um he genuinely ca- and he he genuinely believes like there's no doubt there's no doubt in Paul's in Paul's life mm-hmm. <clears throat> he he is serious about the words he says he truly believes them 
and he needs other people to understand him and believe him as well yeah. because he thinks it's important because it's it, it is important i mean it's what we're sharing right here you know he says again he keeps restating like the same things like get yourself ready yeah. because like seriously it is that important yeah like you really need to take this you really need to get this like the enemy is much more serious than you are about this yeah <laughs> and you need to Way get more. ready um and that's that's you know that's where he's getting at here he's saying like, please for the love of for the love of goodness get yourself ready yeah put on that armor yeah put it all on <laughs> um because you need to be able to stand this day the, the what you're up against right now it's bad mm-hmm. it's bad so you need to be ready and and this is not new either to Paul. Um, we find this all through the New Testament again. And Jesus, over and over again, Jesus says um, that we need to be prepared. We need to be watching. We need to be sober, um, and and expecting His return, expecting um, the trials that are to come, essentially. And and th- I mean, this is this is just a um, reoccurring topic. Just be vigilant. Be careful. Watch. Um, keep yourselves prepared at all times. No, I agree. Um, you know, it's <clears throat> funny that you bring up the the point that he is, he's kind of cocky and it made me think <laughs> about, um, you know, who Andy Minio is. Oh he's, yeah. He's I've, a heard, Christian I've rapper. heard of him. Yeah. So he's I may got, have actually even heard some of his songs. He's got a song called cocky. And in the chorus, it says, some say I'm cocky. I just know that God's got me. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's like, was Paul the same way? Like, he was he really cocky, or was he just like? I've had I've had someone else tell me that one time. It was funny. It was we were. This is when I was younger. We were playing uh, basketball. I think I think it was basketball. Mm-hmm. And this person, now I am not competitive in any way. No, not even a little not at bit. All. But this other person <laughs> is even more competitive than me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm aware. I am very self aware of my my competitiveness and, and i try to keep that at check or I, I would try to keep it checked um but this person was really 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 aggressive and i was like look hey man i know because he would be a conf- uh, professing christian i said look man i i just want you to know like you gotta be careful like it's just a game okay like don't be too cocky and he was like and he, he just says something simply and he's like uh there's a difference between cockiness and um, confidence confidence yeah. And I looked him dead in the eyes and I said, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah, there is my guy <laughs> trying to help you out there. Uh, no, I just, it reminded me of that. I was just kind of like, I probably could have handled that situation a little more graciously. But yeah, I was also competitive. So that was, that was probably why. Right. <clears throat> so moving on, um, we talked about putting on the, uh, the belt of truth. Hmm. And so in 14, uh, verse 14, it, t- it says, stand there for having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Yes. Yeah. So the right. breastplate of righteousness. We, we started talking about that. When we we got started. So like, that's all right. We're coming okay. back. We were still on target. We're just not on the breastplate of righteousness. <laughs> we are now. Yeah. Now we are. Okay. So the breastplate of righteousness, I think we talked about how this is a reoccurring theme as well in scripture. Yes. Like we're talking about clothed in righteousness. I mean, it's not always a breastplate, but right. um, this idea of wearing righteousness is, is pretty common. Now, why is it important that it's wearing? Why is it important that why does righteousness always get ascribed to uh, clothing? Mm. I'll let you answer that. Just kidding. I shouldn't do I that. That's I don't not know, fair. I don't, I don't know that I have an answer for that. I don't know. Yeah. That I've thought about. Well, that's that. what I mean. Like this is okay. So this is something that like we we hear all the time. And we just you know it it's it's a mystery. Like we just leave it at that. Um, but I feel like just if you think about it, righteousness again. Uh, I think I hinted to it before last time we were talking about it earlier. Um, <clears throat> I left it with a question: Is it, is this our righteousness? Is this us building our own, like building righteousness, or so it's essentially like we're talking about after salvation, like where we're increasing in faith, we're mm-hmm. building, like we're called to works. So is this talking about that? Is it talking about our righteousness, or is it talking about something else? Well, isn't uh, when we're talking about righteousness here? Aren't we really just talking about grace? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was just thinking, yeah. like in uh, in First Peter one thirteen, it says, "Therefore, uh, preparing your mind for action and being sober minded, set your hope full of the grace that will be brought to you uh, at the revelation of Jesus Christ." Yeah, the grace. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so that's exactly right. So righteousness, Engine. recovery time. <laughs> um, 
so uh, this idea of wearing righteousness, the, the importance of that is that it is when you when you put something on, when you wear something. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, I am also a pastor, and my greatest weakness is illustrations. <laughs> just, just, just ask anybody. <laughs> I always butcher them. Uh, let me try this again. Uh, so when you when you talk about clothing, the mm-hmm. one thing that you do that's consistent with clothing, no matter what the clothing is, is that you have to put them on, right? It's not integral to your being. No. We're not born with clothes. No. We have to put them on. Correct. So that... That is that is uh, one of the messages that is being conveyed here when you're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. And all, not, I'm not just taking the breastplate of righteousness here. I'm talking about all of the examples we have in Scripture where we talk about righteousness, robes of righteousness, mm-hmm. um, being clothed in righteousness. Yep. <clears throat> and the reason is is that, um, like you were just saying, it, when it ties back to grace. <laughs> it's in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, man was naked. Mm-hmm. We were perfect and naked. Right. Yep. Uh, well, we were good. Yeah, we were very I good. Says that we were perfect. We were very good. And <laughs> I just didn't. I if just you realized. find that translation, let me know. I, I know. I, I caught myself and I was like, you know, because I, I almost said the thing, same thing. Like, that's a whole debate again. Mm-hmm. Um, like I've been saying with many other things. And I'm like, I can't keep saying that. Um, yes. And so we were very good. God called us good. And right. we, I mean, we were naked. Um, and then only after we sinned were, was, were clothed, was clothing introduced, mm-hmm. right? And we had to, God. And um, we made the decision to put that on. Yeah, well, it, and it, that's a very interesting uh, point. Mm-hmm. I actually, yeah, that's a very interesting point. I'd love to get into that sometime. But um, what happened was that God ended up pro- providing the clothing, right? Man tried to clothe himself, <clears throat> so we tried to clothe ourselves. Um, but then God ultimately was like, no, I'm going to give you better clothes. Mm. I'm going to provide you with clothing. And that was through the sacrifice of animals, right? right? The animals had to die in order for the hide to be provided. Um, and so that was the very first, uh, very first example we have of clothing. Right. And so this, this is almost like a, um, a parallel an analogy essentially of, of where we're at now or the whole, if you look at salvation itself, it's the same idea. You talk about grace and, and I think that's exactly right. God in his grace provided us with the clothes we needed. Mm-hmm. Same thing for salvation. Yeah. God through his grace provides us with the righteousness that we need. Um we can't we've I mean many have tried and failed to be righteous on their own. Um and we have a form I, I mean as humans I mean look around us, right? There are people who are good, right? We talk about this all the time there are good people in the world. Um and there are people who we would classify as bad. I think that's a little <clears throat> I think this idea of just strictly classifying people as good and bad can be a little simplistic, mm. I guess is one way of saying it. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, God essentially judges all that way, but I mean, he's God, so he's got that right. Um, we don't necessarily, but we still love to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so... <clears throat> We have our own form of righteousness, no doubt. By our own human standards, sure, there are good people. We have a certain aspect or element of goodness or that we can muster or produce. But if you really ap- like, then apply that to a, a golden standard or God's standard. Um, Which we're all going to fall short of. Exactly. Even our righteousness is counted as filthy rags. Yeah. Even our best, the best of the best, is still pales in comparison to God. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so that we have this um this idea that we are I mean woefully inept. Um oh how what how do the Calvinists call that? Dang it. How do the Cal what do the Calvinists call it? They are it's a uh total depravity. There you go. Yes. Uh we are totally depraved. And uh and as a result we the only hope we had was in God's grace, His His love or favor, and so He He did. He provided His He provided that through Jesus Christ, His, his Son. Yeah. And through that sacrifice, we now have the clothing of righteousness. Mm-hmm. We are able to put on righteousness, not our own, but Jesus' righteousness, true, Truth. true righteousness. Truth. Yes. Back Truth. to that belt. Here we go. Well, <laughs> it's it's funny because one of the things that um, stuck out to me when I was reading um, verse fourteen, it says stand. Mm. The very first word is stand. Yeah. 
And if you go to Luke 12, 35, it says, stay dressed for action and mm. keep your lamps burning. Yeah. Like, we've already established that now is the time. Yes. Now is the time to get on the armor of God, yeah. to get ready for battle. The battle is here. Yes. It's time to get ready. We cannot doing we cannot do that sitting idly by. No, yeah. And, and, and yeah, we've touched on that, like this idea of sober-mindedness, preparedness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So we, we have to be... Literally, you know, it's it's stand by to get some because yeah. it's common. So I mean, if we're I mean, if we really want to take this passage and and really truly apply it to our lives, um, in a in a meaningful way. I, I think what we have here is actually what God is telling us is that <clears throat> as Christians, this idea of standing is it's a call to action. It's right. a, it's an it's a active um, mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Active verbiage, I suppose is how I should put it. Um, yeah, and and if you really look at the, like the the um, the customs of the times when this was written, um, this idea of uh, girding your loins mm -hmm. is the same idea, yeah. uh, which is the passage I think you, going back to the passage that you um, brought yeah, up. Yeah, Isaiah eleven uh, five. It is, uh, Isaiah right. eleven five. It is Isaiah Righteousness 11, shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness of the belt of his loins. Yeah, and then you had Luke twelve thirty five as well, which says correct. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Yep. Um, this idea of staying dressed for action is like the culturally would have been like they had, you know, tunics mm -hmm. or robes, right. long ones. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted to run, <laughs> tunics and robes are not conducive to no. running. <laughs> um, but what they had is they had belts then and that they could hoist their robes up, tie them up higher. Yep. And that way they could run. Their legs were free to run. And that's this idea of being dressed for action. Um, and, and we have a little bit of that here. And when it says being fastened to the belt of truth, that could be in reference. Like some people could take that that way. You know, it's a reference of girding your loins. Although I think what we have here in the armor of God is more of like this idea of a Roman centurion, mm -hmm. um, the armor that they would have worn, which was not long robes. Um, no. because obviously no. they were always ready for battle. They had to be. They should be, should yeah. have been. Um, so they didn't have long robes. Um, but it's still the same, the same idea, you know, in your right, like that, that, that word standing or stand is, is, is call is, um, referring back to that kind of an idea of being prepared. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I, I like how, um, you know, Isaiah 59, 17 puts it, um, says he, he put on righteousness as the breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garment of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. What? So I didn't even I wasn't even aware of this verse. I wonder I, I'm gonna have to look at that then later and see what the context is for right? that. That is interesting because then we also have um well I mean you have it right there, first Thessalonians five eight. Yep. Uh, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Now, so it's a little bit of a variation here. This is Paul speaking again, so it's the same author, but it's a little bit of a variation. He says the breastplate of faith and love versus the breastplate of righteousness. Um, but then if we think of righteousness in context, then we understand that where does righteousness come from? It is through our faith in Jesus. In other words, through our faith in Jesus is love or God's love. God's love for us is Jesus. And so our faith in love or faith and love um, would be the same relative idea as righteousness yeah. that is where righteousness comes from is faith and love so um it is the same idea <clears throat> but what's interesting and we're gonna have to tie in and like because i think uh, since we brought up the verses anyway i'm gonna have to tie into it because we have you see how many times here the uh breastplate and the helmet are combined yep. or they're they're put together yep. in this passage in the whole in ephesians 6 it's not you know we have later on it talks about uh, the helmet of salvation, right? About this combination. Actually, I'm gonna ask this. As a, I'm gonna present this as a question. So, for, first, I like being unfair. First Thessalonians five eight says, "But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, mm -hmm. and for the helmet of hope and salvation." Yeah. So, like to me, I think a lot of people think about that if we go back to our two ways of thought here a lot oh, of yeah. people put on the the helmet they have that hope 
that hope of salvation. And they're yeah. like, oh, that's enough. Yeah. But they're running around with their helmet on backwards. <laughs> right? <laughs> like they've got no other armor on. They're just running around. That's, yes. And, yeah. and it's like, they, they're they like, I'm good. Yeah. Because I've got that hope of salvation. Okay. That is exactly what I want to get into. Okay. So um, when I preached, when I preached on this text, that's, I, this is actually exactly what I honed in on. Um. And what's wild is that at that time I didn't even know about first. I didn't have First Thessalonians five eight, mm. or or for that matter Isaiah fifty nine seventeen. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I I didn't even like. I mean, not that I never read them before, but I had just not put them together for the for the message. And um, what I really honed in on is, as Christians and as people in a war, right? Um, Paul ta- Paul Paul's telling telling us here. He says, "Put on what." The whole, the full armor. yeah, the yep. full armor of God, right? But what happens so often? Okay, what uh, two of these two of these pieces here of armor, I would call foundational. Mm-hmm. They're like essential. Mm. Like you, you really almost can't be a Christian without them. Yeah, and that is what salvation and truth. Yeah, the, well, uh, I guess you could say yes, truth as well. But the ones I really honed in on were um, salvation, the helmet of salvation. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, that's I mean, it's salvation. If you're not saved, you're not a Christian. So, right. um, but in, in Thessalonians here, he puts it as the hope of salvation, which again, you can make the case that that's the same thing realistically. Uh, because even though we have essentially, technically we have salvation, we have, <laughs> I don't want to open up that can of worms. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Um, Essentially, what we have is more of a hope of salvation than mm-hmm. anything else. Okay, we are, in our minds, in, in according to our faith, we are saved. Yes, but in in essence, I mean, what we have through again through a lot of the epistles, anyways, and Paul's writings, he talks about a future salvation. Um, but what he's referring to is our our true forms, essentially our our true our full salvation, mm-hmm. once we're in heaven, once we're before God, once we're with Him, um, and we have our new bodies. Uh, that is the end, the completion, the fullness of our salvation. So that's the kind of the hope of salvation. That's the future mm-hmm. salvation. Um, not that we're not saved now. It's just that we're not, we're not completely, we're not completed yet. Um, so this is salvation, the helmet of salvation, foundational. Every Christian should have a helmet. <laughs> should have the helmet of salvation should, if they're a Christian. Are they wearing it the right way? Well, okay, so here we go. Now... What is the other one? If we're saved, what do we have? The righteousness, mm-hmm. the clothes of righteousness. Like, right. So the breastplate, right? Well, if we're saved and we have that salvation, what we have is the breastplate of righteousness. Mm. Now, what is unique about these two, other than the fact that they're foundational, what is unique about these two pieces of armor? What do they protect? The core. Yeah. Essentially, all of your vitals, right? Right, the brain, mm-hmm. the head, um, and then all of the organs. Yeah, those are, you know, that's core. Exactly, you're exactly right. That's foundational. So, as Christians, <clears throat> God's like, "Welcome to the army." Like you've like welcome to my my family. We're in a battle. Welcome to the army. Mm-hmm. Here's your helmet. Here's your right. here's your uh, breastplate. Here's your gear. You're you're set. You won't die. Like I've protected every. And by the way, we're talking about the armor of God here. We're not talking about like right regular old armor. You know that's like fallible. You know where you can it can be pierced if there's a strong enough weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, no, we're talking about the armor of God, which is like it's impenetrable. It, yes, exactly, impenetrable. Great word. So he's like, "Welcome to the army. You're set. You you won't die." Yeah. Right. But you got to put it on. But we're running around. Well, we have. If, if you're saved, right. if you are truly saved, you have put those two on. Mm. Those two are on. Or otherwise, you're not saved. Mm. You don't have salvation, and you don't have righteousness. Mm. And without those, I mean, without that, you're not. Oh, I see. I see what you're doing. So, so you're. I'm looking at it from the perspective of that you can. As human beings, we have a tendency to take it on and put it on, put it on and take it off when it's convenient for us. But what right. you're saying is. Spiritual wise, once you've accepted Christ yes. as your savior, you wear it all the time. Well, remember until you choose to take it off. That's exactly right. So, 
And and that's a great point. You mm-hmm. could technically choose to take these things off. Right. You could. My argument would be that if you take these these, thing, these two things off, you're not a Christian you're, anymore. You're, you're gonna die. You're not a Christian anymore. Like okay. you have rejected. You have committed apostasy. Essentially. I, see, I see what you're saying. Because remember, we're talking about a mentality, not not right. actual armor. Right, 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 right. We're talking about a way of thinking. Mm-hmm. So again, if you if you're a Christian, your way of thinking, you already have the helmet and the breastplate. That is foundation. Like, if you're a Christian, that's what you have. Yep. So it's it's God's way of saying, <clears throat> again, I'm just highlighting here how God is intentional about how He says things, mm. and how everything He says has order and reason. So this idea of the helmet and the breastplate, you are part of the army, or or you've been welcomed into the kingdom. You're a part of God's family. You're now a child of God. You're you're part of this war. He has protected you. You have the helmet. You have the breastplate. Your vitals are covered. You will not die. Mm. You're set. Your your salvation is secured. Your life is secured. But we still have Paul telling us, put on the whole armor of God. Why does he tell us that? Because, okay, again, every Christian has some, Mm -hmm. but do we have it all? Now, the reason is because you can send a person with a, a, a helmet and a breastplate into war and what's going to happen, especially if you're having you're in this battlefield where the fiery darts are everywhere? You have this person running into war. <laughs> their arms and legs are, yeah, are just they're they're not running into war if they get their no, legs hit. Their arms and legs are vulnerable, and they are they're going to experience excruciating pain and and be useless in the in the battle. They're just going to be running around getting hit, <laughs> especially if they didn't take the sword. If they don't have their shield, like they're just that's it. Like they're mm-hmm. they're running around useless. They're not gonna die. They're protect they're protected in that way, but they are vulnerable, um, fragile, and just useless in this in this battle, just absolutely useless. Um so yeah, that's I think uh, one of the main one of the most significant things, uh, not the most significant, but one of the main things that I I really thought was interesting in this study of the armor of God was just that he, if you really pay attention to it and look at it carefully, God has given us everything we need to survive. Yes. We will not die in this battle. No one, mm-hmm. no Christian dies in this battle. Mm-hmm. But if you don't put on the rest of this armor, you are a sack of potatoes You're in this have battle. A time. You are just a, you are just an actual liability. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think it's interesting because you segued way exactly into verse 15, where it says, and shoes of for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Yeah. And reading that, it made me think of, and I had to look it up because I didn't remember it exactly, but um, another Andy Minio song, as you can tell, I like Andy <laughs> Minio. All right. Um, Good to the, know. The name of the song is called Wild Things. Mm. And it's in the second verse where it talks about, um, it says, I'm ducking stones thrown from the Pharisees, gospel of peace upon my feet like a paracletes. Um, right, like paracletes. Walking with the paraclete, that's Greek for the spirit. So um, if we look at, um, if we go back to Isaiah 52, 7, it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who mm-hmm. brings good news, yeah. who pub." Uh, publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Yes. So I, what I really love about this, the verse 15, um, shoes for your, having shoes for your feet, the, gospel, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Perfect. Mm-hmm. What is that verse talking about? <clears throat> to me, it's... Like, you know, going into battle is more than just, you know, being ready to fight against the enemies. It's about bringing the word. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and if you think about it, um, you can put it in the context of a battle. There's always messengers in battle, especially yeah. especially this time frame. Like, nowadays, it's all digital. So, I mean, yeah. you're doing it all through it's the all computer. Tweets. But, yeah. Um, but during that time, there was always dedicated messengers. These were quick people. They were mm-hmm. nimble. They weren't necessarily good for battle. I mean, they could fight, but they weren't the greatest warriors, but they were quick Yeah, and they could run. Mm-hmm. They could run long distance. And they, they had to. Granted, you could also ride horses and stuff like that. But back then, in this time, there were there was common mm-hmm. for them to be actual runners. Um, 
but then if you put this into the context of the church um and like just the the christian realm i suppose yeah um like our day-to-day what we're talking about here in these in these verses is uh, essentially evangelism. Mm-hmm. We have the gospel of peace being given, and how is it given? You have to go. Yep. You have to have your feet ready, and you have to go with it, right? So here is evangelism tied in with the armor of God. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what does this mean? What, it, it, what does it mean? It, it's even like in <clears throat> Romans, um, Romans 10, it, it talks about how... Um, how are they to preach unless they are sent? Yeah. As it is written, how beautiful are the f- are the feet of those who preach the good news? Quoting, like I have, quoting Isaiah 52. Right I there. have never in my life thought of feet as beautiful, right? Like that's just, I'm not, <laughs> just, that's not my thing. It's a different culture, man. Also, yeah, well, but <laughs> I was going to say, what there are those in that, this culture too. I guess. That's true. <laughs> but to me, what it's saying is <clears throat> preaching the word or sharing the word is not an easy or the most desirable job out there, but it is the most fundamentally needed. Yeah. Well, one there is. Yeah. Uh, Again, we go back to like, how do you, how can you believe if you haven't heard? Mm -hmm. And then how can they hear unless someone speaks, speaks it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and how, and then actually I believe in the same passage Paul says, then how can they um, speak it unless they go? Right, so we have to go. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this idea of evangelism in Christianity. Like this, <clears throat> it is. It, it is like it, as part of the gospel, it's foundational. There is an element of of going and presenting the gospel. Yeah, and as Christians, if we want to have the full armor, then we need to be able to share the gospel. You have to. You yeah. can't just wait for people to come to you. No, I mean, because b- people need to hear it. Like, and and it's not like it's not the feet. Pre- um, uh, clothed in the preparation of having as shoes for your feet, the full knowledge of the entire Bible. No, that's not what it says. It's not the complete and exhaustive understanding of God. Uh, no, it's just the gospel. It's the gospel of peace. And and we, if you're a Christian, you should you know it. Like again, this is one of those things. If you're a Christian and you know the gospel, or I would hope you do because that's how, that's how you became a Christian. Um, and maybe you don't know it completely and perfectly, and that's fine. That's not the idea here. It's just this idea of being able to share, <clears throat> being able to share what you have, the hope that you have. You don't have to know everything to be a Christian. I no. don't believe that anyhow. No, like I, no. I think, you know, I've, I've been asked one time um, at work by a coworker. He said, you know, what, what makes you better than me meaning like me as a christian Mm. what makes you any better than me and and at the moment that he said this he said it out of anger yeah frustration and frustration Mm -hmm. and i replied to him i said absolutely nothing i said the only difference between your average christian and your average non-christian is that i know that i am flawed i know that i make mistakes i know that i'm a sinner Mm-hmm. But I have a desire to bury through that and get better and yeah. to be better. Well, you have a you have a calling to holiness, you know. And God says, "Be holy, for I am holy." So, yeah, yeah. So, I, I to me, that's really the only difference because a lot of people have the mis misconception that if they go to church, that there's a bunch of perfect people there. That's not the truth. You know, it's 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 the whole it's the the old um, you know quote is that. Um, church isn't a museum for the good. It's a hospital for the broken. Mm. I mean, ideally in church, you would see all walks of life. Right. Um, I mean, you see, you would have those who are fresh from the kingdom of darkness um, and who have, you know, still are struggling with that new mindset, who are just, you know, new to light and, and to, to, to the truth. But then hopefully you also have a lot of people, or at least a few people in the church who are, um, veterans who are experienced and who who exemplify what it means to walk in the light or right. walk in the spirit, because I mean we we all need hope and Jesus is the ultimate hope, obviously. Um, but we, it's good for us as believers, it's good for us as, as humans to then have human examples too. Yeah, 
And again, I don't want to detract from Jesus because he was a human example as well, but he was fully human, fully God. Mm. Um, and so sometimes what can happen for us is, for us as, as people is, is that we look at that and we think, ah, it's just not very relatable. Like it's difficult to relate then to Jesus because he's just, well, he's Jesus. He's perfect. And I'm not. Um, but then, so hopefully what we have in the church is examples of what it means to fully walk out um, the calling that Jesus has given us. So then we have hope. You have hope for those younger, the younger Christians for coming on. Yeah. Verse 16. Um, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And talked noticed about the, flaming darts before. Well, so. he brought, he, he, yeah, he's tying it right back into what he said in the beginning. Yeah. 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 And, and notice what he says, the verbiage here. It says, I mean, he uses all twice here. So right. in all circumstances, every circumstance, <laughs> take the shield of faith yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Every situation, use that thing. And then what does it say? Why? Because it is able to extinguish all of those flaming darts. Yep. It'll take them all for you. Like, so if nothing else, again, if, and I, I once again, I think there's importance in the, in the, um, uh, help me, <laughs> the order. Thank you. Right. There's importance in the order of these things here. Again, we start with the belt of truth. Um, everything has to start on truth. If it's not truth, then you're up a creek without a paddle. Um, then you have the breastplate of righteousness mm -hmm. and the helmet of sal well, we don't we haven't even gotten actually actually haven't gotten to the helmet of salvation. And that might be for a different reason. Let's just play that one out, I guess. Right. Preparation, uh feet prepared for um presenting the gospel. <clears throat> and then now we have the shield of faith. Um so now with the shield of faith, we're able to actually so with the feet, again, um, Flesh of righteousness, vitals are covered, where you're you're okay. Um, looking at it in the sense of the battle again, you have the feet being prepared. You have to be able to move. Yep. You have to be able to move in the field. Um, and in order to do that, apparently the way we move in the field is by sharing the gospel, um, mm. presenting the hope that we have with others, uh, sharing it. Um, <clears throat> and then we have the, the shield of faith. And the shield of faith is now finally we're able to to really protect ourselves to, to quench every dart, and so we're finally being, um, we're not being injured anymore. Right. We're not liabilities in the fight anymore. <laughs> so, so up to this point, all this stuff is non negotiable. Like you should wear it, you should wear it now, you should have it. Yeah. Boom. Right. I there. mean, I mean, the case could be made that each and every one of these pieces is non negotiable. I I highlighted the the helmet and the breastplate only for the sake of. It's highlighted. There, it's together in other passages as well, right. and because it is essentially all of your vitals. Mm -hmm. Like, and again, it is foundational. Faith, you can make the argument, is also foundational because mm -hmm. without faith, then you can't have salvation. However, I think what we have here as the faith, um, again, tying right back to what we talked about in the beginning of this, um, we're not talking about the faith, the mustard seed faith. We're talking about the after salvation right. faith. We're talking about that faith that. Um, is continuing to build. Right. And so essentially, I always got the the image in my mind, at least, of, um, <laughs> I'm really going to put myself out here. Uh, um, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Hopefully people don't care. I watch, I watch anime, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, the shield is something that a lot of people in anime would, would use. It's like this thing, like, you never have, well, if anybody watches anime, you never have normal weapons. Oh, no. Or anything, right? If it's a sword, then somehow this thing will find a way to transform. It's extra. And it's it's always oh, yeah. it's always extra. Yes. Yeah. Same thing for shields, right? And I always, like, you never have a normal shield in these things. The shield always has some way to be able to grow, mm -hmm. right? The shield never stays, like, they'll start off, like, tiny, like it's like a little backpack shield. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's like a like an armband shield or something, <laughs> yeah. something dumb. And and then they're in the middle of a fight, and the next thing you know, the shield is like the size of three people. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> it's like taking everything, and you're like, What? This is so awesome. <laughs> if you're a nerd. <laughs> I, <laughs> Which I am. Uh, yeah, I'm <sighs> putting, not that put, much of a nerd. Putting myself out there. Right. Um that's anyway. Fair. That's fair. 
Yeah. So, but anyway, no, this is kind of the same mentality I get, like with this faith. Well, it's the idea of faith, right? Mm-hmm. If you're talking about talking about the shield and faith, faith is interesting for us as Christians because it can grow. Mm-hmm. Faith. I mean, we start with a mustard seed, right? Mm-hmm. That's where we start off right. for salvation. Um, but hopefully, as we continue to grow as Christians, this the, it's continuing to grow. Our faith continues to build. And so I get this. I, I always got that same image, like of the shield of faith. Um, like depending on the circumstances we're in, depending on how big the attack is we're experiencing, the shield grows mm. and takes everything. Like it just covers our whole bodies, and it's just taking every attack. Yeah, <clears throat> I like it. I wasn't sure where you were going with that, but yeah, uh, I, I, know. I see it now. I know. Oh, I'm glad it tied in at the end there. <laughs> I was really <laughs> risking that. <laughs> was... Well, I, I think it's interesting that you know all of this is like you know, mandatory, like put it on now, yeah. put it on right. And and if you look at Exodus uh, 12, 11, it says, um, in this manner, you shall eat it um, with your belt fastened, your sandals in your feet and your staff in your, um, in your hand. Hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, you shall eat, eat it with haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So mm, yeah. to me, and maybe you, you see something else here, to me it's, hey, look, just because there's a break in the action doesn't mean you can put your stuff down. Right. you got to stay battle ready. Yes. I think that's an excellent um, comparison. I mean, <laughs> I'd have to go into, again, context is key for me here. I, I think it's, this is talking about the first Passover feast um, that's given to us, but... It's the same idea, yeah. Right. It's this idea as 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 God's children, as His people. Um, yeah, we're not we're not called to leisure. We're called to action. This this world is not our home. Mm-hmm. This is not our comfort zone. This this is this is a battlefield. Yeah. Um, we'll be home one day, but not not yet. And we can look forward to that. But right now, we're in battle. We're called to action. And and I think that's the one <clears throat> thing that a lot of people don't grasp. Yeah. Like they hold on to this well, life in this world with everything they have as if it's it's the end all game and it's oh, yeah. not. Oh, yeah. Enter prosperity gospel. I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like the focus for so much of pop Christianity is that. Um, oh, and again, I don't I don't want to be vague here. When I say pop Christianity, I'm talking about popular Christianity, right? Like mainstream, right. mainstream Christianity. Um, you know, that's that's the focus. It's it's, it's all about me. Me, myself, and I, like how, like, yeah, I want God, you know, what's he going to give me? Like, yeah, I'll, I'll take, I'll take some, I'll take some Christianity, but uh, what do, what do I get? You know, yeah. What's, what's in it for me? Yeah, what, it, it, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I think that, I think it's easy, especially in the world that we live in, to get that way. Oh, yeah. To have that mentality because that's the way everything is. Yeah. You know, everybody's well, about what's in it for me. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's, uh, again. How about salvation, my guy? <laughs> <laughs> sounds pretty yeah. good to me. I mean, we talk about difficult times, time, uh, you know, hard times and stuff, and, and definitely in a lot of ways, spiritually speaking, we're in difficult times. But uh, in a more material way, we are in the time of leisure, peace. Mm. Um, like th- there's war in the world, but it's not here, <laughs> right? You know, um, there's there's conflict, sure. Um, you know, we have we have tensions. But it's not the same. And and even if you go beyond that and you look at just um, lifestyles, culture, I mean, we work, yeah. Um, and we find ways to work a lot, sure, but it is not the same as back. And, like, uh, even these times weren't as difficult as it's been, you know. there's There, there are people who have lived through so much more mm. than what we do or what we have. I mean, I... I have, you know, I have it really nice compared to what other people have been through. Compared to what my oh, father geez. was went through, what my grandfather went through, like things have definitely been worse. And so that's always the. I mean, that's there's benefits, but there's downsides too. Spiritually speaking, it is much more difficult. I, I mean, I have always sought challenge and adversity for the simple fact that I know. That in times of peace and in times of idleness, it is so much 
easier to fall into temptation. Oh, yeah. It is so much easier to mess up and to, and to be led astray. Mm. Whereas when you're in times of persecution, you're in difficult times, you're, you're in survival mode. Yes. Things become so much clearer. Yeah. And, and you just all of a sudden know what you need. And, and you can make much better decisions, typically. And that's a little bit of what we're up against here, like in our culture right now, is that it's, I mean, we're, we're lulled into a kind of uh, numbness. And, and I think you see that a lot in prayer. At least I feel convicted of that in my prayer life. Mm. Like I pray or I have prayed a lot for what I want mm, yeah, and okay. not necessarily what I need. Right. You know, like, hey, I, you know, God, I could really, you know, I'd love to have this yeah. this job, <laughs> this you know, job, yeah, exactly. that'd, be, that'd be pretty sweet. But like, God, um, man, if you could really just... Make work go easy for the next month. That'd be great. But but in reality, God's already blessed me. Yeah, He's right. already given me a job right. that pays the bills. Right. You know, what? How? Hmm, how dare I ask for more? Mm. Yeah, entitlement is a <laughs> problem. <laughs> It is a son, it's a, of, problem it's here. a son of a gun, man. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yes, it is definitely a struggle in in our in our is, country. Is it entitlement or is it ignorance? Because I I don't I can't honestly say that I do it because I feel like I deserve it. I'm I'm asking for it because I'm not clearly thinking about what I have. Yeah, yeah. I'm focusing on the that. Sure, sure. I I think. Personally, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, ignorance and, and entitlement in a lot of ways. Where do you see entitlement the most? <clears throat> well, okay. I'm in in put life? This, this is, okay, let me I'm not even gonna ask it. This is where I see entitlement the most. My kids. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they don't know any better. No. I mean, they've just grown up knowing that mom and dad provide. Like, yeah. they're given what they need and then some. Um and so from that, you know, you could say uh, ignorance of, or not, maybe that's not the right word, lack of experience, lack of, um, well, yeah, lack of experiencing trials and, mm-hmm. and difficult times. They just feel like this is normal, like this is just what's expected, right. is that they get what they want. <laughs> um, so yeah, you could say, I, again, I, I would say that they're they're connected. It's not always the case, but most of the time, most of what I see, entitlement is almost like a direct result of ignorance mm-hmm. or, or lack of experience. I like that. Ignorance and lack of experience. I think that that encompasses it quite well. Mm-hmm. And then that's, you know, it ties back then into the idea of persecution and, and tribulation helping us see better. It's opening our eyes. Mm. It it shows it's that experience that we needed to be able to realize, hey, I actually had it nice. <laughs> yeah, I had it good. <clears throat> it's it's strange because you bring up you know your kids, and I think back to when I was a kid, and I think of all the things that I didn't have, or I couldn't have, or that I wanted. Yeah, and I look at those things now, and I'm like, okay. How much of those were wants and how much of them were needs? Right. Because I'd like to think that I give my kids everything they need. Yeah. But the reality is, is that I probably give them too much of what they want. <laughs> yeah. Well, but isn't that the, so? I'm like from your background, and I have. Well, my background's a little weird. <laughs> it's a little mixed. Because <laughs> um, I mean, I, we don't want to be. I don't want to be ignorant of the fact that there are there are genuine cases like it's not a it's not fair to make a blanket statement saying that everyone in this nation experiences luxury. Mm. Um, there are definitely people who don't. Yes. Um, and typically those. Um, uh, well, again, that wouldn't be fair either. Okay. Let me backtrack here. Save. Try and save myself. Um. There are different experiences. You can experience life very differently here. Um, mm-hmm. I would say for the for the majority, we're a pretty po- prosperous country, and we experience luxury and yes. and leisure. 
more than is healthy for us. I would I would argue. That would be my case at least. Um but for those of us who did grow up in a little bit of leaner times and more difficult circumstances, it is our tendency to try to do the opposite for our kids. Um, to give them more than what we had. Because we're trying to, in a lot of ways, I mean, <laughs> this, I've heard people say this is essentially all of parenting is that you're trying to teach a younger version of you or trying to give a younger version of you what you never had. Yeah, um, yeah. I, which, which is dangerous, <laughs> yeah. I would say. It's but that's dangerous. typically where we fall into. Like as parents, that's what, we've, that's what we like tend towards is to treat our kids like younger versions of ourselves and just trying to um, undo the mistakes of the, our past. Um, or, or, you know, some version of that. Um, but yeah, that's our, that's our tendency. Like we would try to give them what we never had and that can be dangerous because we don't, we, we miss the significance in our own suffering a lot of times. It's true. I I think about the times that I suffered the most, um, you know, the times where I cried out to God, why? Yeah. Were the times, the the moments that defined me. Yeah, yeah, that made me who right. I am today. Right, and that is—I mean, that's that's all through Scripture again. Like, I mean, look at David in the Psalms. Mm. So many times, over and over again. I mean, David had—he had a good life, but he had a rough life yeah. too. And that I think is like kind of the summation of Christians. Like that is the life we ex- should expect. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's good. It's it's going to be good. God's going to be good to us. Of course, He's going to be good. But it's going to be rough. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> I, I think if more people truly understood that we would like, if they had the mentality, I'm happy with what I have. I would like to have more, but I definitely understand I don't deserve, I deserve, I definitely understand that I deserve much worse. Yeah. Then and only then can you find true contentment. Hey, godliness with contentment. Yeah. Is great gain. There you go. Uh, I've I've taught on this. Yeah, godliness with gain. Actually, uh, I wish I could pull the verse up now because I want to always say it. Contentment with godliness mm-hmm. is great gain. Um, I think you could almost use it interchangeably. I'd have to really go back and uh, when I when I taught on this, it wasn't like an in depth. Unfortunately, I didn't like really parse it out in the Greek or anything like that. But um, this idea of like contentment and godliness. It's interesting that it says contentment with godliness <clears throat> or godliness with contentment. Either way, I think you could say it. It would be accurate and it would say that carry, convey the same message. It's, it's not one or the other. It's both. Um, and because it's, it's both because um, you shouldn't just have contentment. Like to be a just a content kind of person is dangerous, is almost equally dangerous because right. – you, you, you have just nothing become to go after. complacent. Yeah. Yeah. It's just complacency. Um, you're not bad but then, already. Yeah, exactly. But then if you're, if you have godliness, um, with contentment, with that mm. contentment, then it's good because That's what is godliness? Godliness is, is like a, an increase in virtue. Mm-hmm. It's virtue, right? Yeah. But it's not just virtue. It's increasing virtue in, in a lot of ways because, um, <clears throat> we're not perfect. But when we are godly, we're again when be, to be godly is not necessarily to be perfect. To be godly is to have a certain mentality, and that mentality is is a, uh, and a, um, uh, it's a draw like it, it would be a mentality that is drawn towards good things, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, I think of the verse that talks about if there's any goodness, if there's any virtue, if there's any righteousness, if there's any faith or love, if there's anything good, think on those things focus on those things right <clears throat> so that is godliness is to be have a focus on good things so then you're still not perfect but you're increasing right because you've got that mentality of godliness so you're increasing in your godliness um so contentment with godliness is great gain because you're it's exactly what you just basically outlined this idea of like um i i'm content with what i have but I want more goodness. But I recognize that I could have, I, I deserve much less than what I already have. 
And that's essentially what that is. Godliness with contentment. Right. I like it. So in verse 17, yes. we're finally getting into the sword, the sword, the, awesome spirit, the helmet of salvation, <laughs> yes. the sword and the spirit. Uh, verse yes. 17 says, <clears throat> and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, mm-hmm. which is the word of God. The word of God. And that's not the only place, once again, not the only place nope. th- that the word of God is, is um, illustrated as a sword or or referred to as a sword. Uh, again, we go back to Hebrews chapter 12, I believe. Yeah. Um, we talked about the word of God being active and... For the word of God is living and active, yes. sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Yep. Another great thing, the intention, the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The heart is exceedingly wicked. Yeah. Who can know it? Apparently the word God of God knows can. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty easy, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Even I, well, I know it, but I don't understand it. I don't no. pretend like I do. Well, and that's, that's it, isn't it? We're talking about our own hearts. Yeah. Like, who can even understand their own heart? That's diff- that's crazy. Let alone someone else's. Are you kidding me? Yep. <laughs> yeah, but then the, the Word of God is able to do that. And it, uh, also, going back to it's it can divide between the soul and the spirit. I don't know. I have not heard one person give a compelling or convincing um definition or or like different different differentiation dif- that's a word yeah, that'll work uh, let's like just it. pretend yeah <laughs> no one like i've never heard anyone be able to describe to me the differences between the soul and spirit i mm. i and i still haven't been able to do it like i I'd, I'd it's something that i'm very much interested in and i'm i truly would love to know but it, i'm i'm at the point now where i'm like maybe this is one of the mysteries of god i might not understand i don't know um but yeah, the, but the word of God can. So yeah. actually, I guess I, what I need to do is just keep doubling back onto the word of God and just keep going at it until eventually it it shows me, it, it separates that for me. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> but yeah, so getting back to this idea of warfare now, we have this sword, right? Because um, we've talked about the helmet of salvation now before yep. this already. So we can, I think, it'd be pretty safe to just jump straight to the sword, which is the most awesome one. I'm just kidding. Get some. <laughs> Everybody, want, I've noticed your swords that you have hanging on the wall over yeah, there, too. I've had those since I was a kid. Yeah. They're like training swords for those who are listening. They're like these black um, poly something. They're plastic. They're heavy duty plastic, but they're just, they're, they're training swords that I've had ever since I was young. Actually, my daughter and I, my oldest daughter and I, were playing with them to just today. Well, the oldest, too. We, nice. were, we were all, we took turns sparring. Get some. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Get after it. Start it while they're young. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I think it's it's interesting. Um, Isaiah 49, 2. Mm. Uh, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. Mm. In the shadow of his hand, he held me. Mm. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. Wow. Man, I mean, you're getting these verses... I just... It's crazy. I don't know where you find these. But they're good. In they're the good. Bible. They're in the Bible. Well, I, yeah. yeah. All, right, all right. That's fair. But it's it's <laughs> it's interesting to me that we we went from the spiritual realm mm-hmm. with the armor mm-hmm. to now God putting us as the, the weapon. The weapon is 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 with us. Yeah. Right. It's in our mouths essentially. Right. And again, once again, there's these themes through scripture. This is not new. Um now we're in the old testament here with this one. Uh but in Revelation this comes back. Um where it talks about when Jesus returns. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's riding a horse and from his mouth comes this two edged sword. sword. Yep. Um this idea of this of the sword being referenced or or related to the mouth. Um Again, there's reason, there's purpose for this. So even in even in this passage in Ephesians we have here, it's what is the sword? It's the word of God. Where yeah. the word where's the word of God come from? From his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, and it says that perfectly in, in Hosea six five. Yeah. It says, Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. Uh, I have slain them by the word of my mouth. Yeah. And with judgment goes forth as the light. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, this this idea or this principle again. So <clears throat> this may be foreign for those who aren't Christians, um, but the the spoken word is has great value in the Christian faith. Um, I mean, it, it's right there in creation. God spoke and it came to be. That's how. I mean, if you have a perfect being, how does how would you imagine a perfect being to interact? <laughs> Again, we're relying on fallible imaginations, but this is the imagination God gave us. Like for me, at least, I, when I think of if if an if there was a perfect being and he was perfect and he had to and he would just do things like in my mind, it comes down to words. Like it's just speaking. Mm -hmm. If he is a, a a true being, there has to be communication first and foremost. Communication right. is is foundational, right? Um, if 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 a perfect being couldn't communicate, then I don't think that would be a perfect being. Um, like that's kind of a foundational principle of, of being. So <clears throat> for, for God, who is this perfect being communication, that is, that's what he has is, is the word, his, his spoken word. And again, in the Greek, this is different because it is actually the Greek and the Hebrew. They are both the same when it comes to the word, when it comes to speaking, um, it's all tied in with the spirit actually. And it's this idea of breath of that. That is spirit. That is, um, but it's also where we get, you know, the word spoken word. Mm. Um, it is from the mouth of God. And from that comes all of life from that comes where well, we have the word of God. It is truth. Um, it is, it's just, it's communication. It's relation in a lot of ways. And if you really break it down to its most basic form, um, it's relation. It's how we, it's how we as, as humans relate. And it's also how God relates to us is through his spirit, through, through what he speaks. Um, but then if you really tie that in, so again, as a perfect being, what God speaks is simply truth. Yeah. And if it wasn't truth before, it is truth now. <laughs> it's yeah, essentially how it is. Right. Like that is God. That is that is God for you. Like he what he speaks is. And so it's the same thing, like for his word. Um, I think what it's talking about here about in this particular passage is the word of God. We're actually talking about the Bible. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it I mean you can it, I, it can apply both ways, I think. Like it, it would be true both ways. Like because obviously whatever God speaks, if God says it. And then it's supposed to be in the Bible. Oh, it's true. <laughs> like it's the Bible, <laughs> and um, and it's not going to go against anything he said before because then it wouldn't be then it, he wouldn't be God because he would be contradictory, mm -hmm. and that's not perfect. That's not perfection. Um, so yeah, whatever he speaks is going to be in agreement with what he's spoken before, which is going to be essentially what he's already given us. Mm. Um, it may be different, like more detailed or something. I don't know, but it's going to be agree with this. It's going to agree with what we already have. Um, assuming that this is inspired, inspired again, of course, which we, we do believe. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, um, you could make the case in what we have here as the written word of God, the written used to be spoken word of, or was spoken word of God. Um, then it has the same power. It is this, this written word has the same power that the spoken word does, which is able to cut and divide and, discern between thoughts and what's interesting if you really study apologetics and in um this idea of of interacting with other even evangelism same thing which they, they go hand in hand um is there's something i don't want to say mystical but there is something powerful about quoting scripture um when you're dealing with uh with well, okay, even as a pastor when you're preaching, um, but when you're dealing with people who don't agree with you um, and or you're trying to make a point, uh, there's something about when you quote scripture, it just seems to really do something. Like it it just, it seems to cut through. Hmm. Like it, it's almost like it, it does genuinely cut through arguments. It cuts through thoughts um, and it just gets to the heart in a way that, you know, my words certainly never yeah, seem to no. be able to do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, there is this, this aspect to it. 
but again, coming back to the armor of God, then bringing this all back to the armor of God. Um, yeah, it is this this idea of having a sword is is huge. This is now our offense. Like we're getting an offense. Now, all of this before. I mean, you could argue that you know, obviously the uh, feet would have been our part of the offense. Mm-hmm. Um, mobility is a is a key part of offense, but um, it's also a key part of defense. So. Um, here we have a sword, and this is our first true piece of offensive weaponry. And it's the Word of God. It is um, what we should be trained on in. As Christians, we need to be trained in the Word of God. Um, as pastors, we know this. I mean, as, as you know, anyone who's a, who's a leader in a church, we should know, I mean, they know that we are we're called to be trained. We're called to be equipped. Um, and... The way we do this is through his word. <clears throat> I mean, there's other ways as well. Obviously, we've got the Holy Spirit who's able to guide us and teach us in all things and to instruct us in all ways. Um, but had the Holy Spirit himself only conveys, only tells us things that he is told to say. The Holy Spirit doesn't give us anything new. He gives us only what he has heard from Jesus himself or from God the Father. And so in a lot of ways, again, we come back to what we have written, the word of God. It should It should match that. It should match what's written. Um, again, it, what the Holy Spirit gives us could be uh, more detailed, more nuanced, but it is not going to disagree with what he has said before in his word. Right. No, I agree. So let me ask you a question. Okay. Verse 18. Yes. What does this mean to you? Because this is something that I've struggled with an understanding of. Okay. Verse 18 states, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. Yes. To that end, keep alert with the perseverance. Yes. Making supplication for all the saints. Yeah. Okay. This is good because this is actually most over. Well, people have started really preaching on this, um, but I remember back when I first heard about, like I was introduced to the, the armor of God and it was taught to me. Um, this is usually, a lot of times this gets this does not get included with this passage um, or it just doesn't get addressed at least. Um, and it's very clearly part of the passage, but sometimes it doesn't get addressed. This is actually our other offensive weapon prayer. Yeah. Um, the, <clears throat> the sword is not the only one. The sword is the primary one, mm-hmm. um, but it's not the only one. Prayer is another one we have. <laughs> I mean, is one of those really popular things is, you know, prayer warriors. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, they, it's, that is, is accurate. Prayer is a, is a form of warfare. combat. Yeah, warfare. Yeah. So, you, I mean, they, it would be accurate to say that prayer, you have prayer warriors. Is the question that you have, is it regarding the, what does it mean to be in prayer at all times? Is that what you're getting at? Or is it just more or less what kind of prayers we're dealing with here? So I guess I, I never really, I do believe that prayer is warfare, but mm. I never saw... It is part of this prayer as like one of the piece, the armor, the part armor, of the armor. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause again, it's not really given as a piece of armor this time. Um, but that might just be because, I mean, Paul's already used pretty much all of the traditional armor. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at the Roman centurions, it's already like he's covered basically all of the pieces already. Um, but, that is not to detract from the importance here because he really ends with this. Now, if he begins with something specific, it's it's also important what he ends with. And what he ends with here is prayer. Um, and that's huge. Um, <clears throat> so praying at all times in the Spirit. Um, th- this idea of praying in the Spirit is important um, because the Spirit is the one, again, he, he, he leads us in all things he teaches us. But in, all the, in another passage, it also says that he is... Um, he intercedes for us as we pray. Um, sometimes when we don't know how to pray, he prays for us. He he um, uh, intercedes for us. That kind of goes, goes along with um, Romans 8.26, where it says, Likewise, yes. the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Yes. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Yeah. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Yeah. With groaning too deep for word. Yep, too deep for words, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have this idea that the Spirit is is helping us as we pray, right? Uh, most people don't think about this. 
you know, we feel like we're on our own. Communication, like, because this is what we're really getting to. What I mean, what is prayer? Prayer is communication. Mm-hmm. And communication is, I mean, again, it's foundational. I mean, just ask any married person. <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's the most important. Yes, in any relationship, communication is key. Um, <laughs> it's the same thing in the church. Like as a pastor, communication is key. Uh, any anytime you're working with, uh, you know, in uh, as a job, communication is vital. Anytime you have coworkers, any situation where there's more than one, communication is vital. So it's the same thing in battle and war. Like communication is everything. And that's where Paul is getting at here. So it's the same idea of prayer. This is what prayer is for us. It is our communi- It is our link, our connection with God. And it should be, I mean, we should keep that open as much as we possibly can. Um, and, and it's important here because he doesn't say, it's not just like he says pray all the time because then um, like it, 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 that could become difficult to try and parse out. Like, okay, how do you pray all the time? Like what... And what is prayer? Like, what exact prayer are we supposed to be doing? Like, are we using the Lord's Prayer? We just, we we put the Lord's Prayer on repeat and we just keep doing it? Like, the you know, do we pray the rosary kind of idea? Right. Yeah. So when we pray, the, like, again, we're coming at this is, this is communi- prayer is communication. You you don't go to your wife and pray the same, and say the same thing over and 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 over, and over again. And yeah, that expect would, that'd be no bueno. No, <laughs> you don't. You, you need something personal. Like she, she's looking for something personal, and I'm not trying to relate God to our, you know, our wives or our spouses, but the relationship that we have with our with our spouses was meant to reflect the relationship we have with God. Yeah, and God is looking for a personal relationship, and that means personal connection. Um. We, uh, praying at all times in the spirit. Uh, there are many different ways to pray, and he lists several of them. He says prayer and supplication, mm-hmm. and I think it's it's I mean, prayer in and of itself is not necessarily simple. And, I, and I've um, done messages on this too, but it, again, it's one of those things that you need a series almost to cover these things because they're it's deep. Like there's mm-hmm. different types of prayer, there's different um, methods for praying, and. Like this idea that, because again, it's not the only place where Paul calls us to a constant prayer. He, you know, he says this over and over again in his epistles. Um, and how do we do that? I mean, m- most most of the time we accept it as like pr- he's not talking about prayer, like literally on our knees praying. Um, <clears throat> it can be, I mean, anything. What is communication? I mean, if you can define communication for me, I can define prayer for you. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I. See, it doesn't come down to one thing. It's, nah. it's many things. It's it's all encompassing in a lot of ways. But it, it I mean, it, it's not that it it's this generic thing that, that's just everything. But it is like communi- It's communication. Like it, it, it's it's. I mean, it's text messages. It's voicemails. It's it's you know phone calls. It's Zoom. It's you know face to face. It can be from a distance. It, it, like. It can be through words. It can be through pictures. It can be through um, art. It can. Uh, there's so many ways to communicate, and in the same way, there's so many ways to pray to communicate with our our Father God. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that it's it's a mistake that the armor of God ends with communication. Mm. Um, I mean, if you look at verses 19 and 20 combined. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to to proclaim the mystery of the gospel Mm. for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Yeah. You know, to me, it's as much time as you put into putting on the pieces of the armor you should be putting into, which are our defense. Yeah. You should be putting into your words. Yeah. Your offensive weapons. Right. So that you can go out and speak boldly, not cocky, but confidently. Yeah. Well, you're really getting into like, <clears throat> like you've got the whole armor on, you're prepared, you're ready. Mm-hmm. You're ready. Where do you go? Yeah. Like, where are we going? 
what are we doing, God? <laughs> like, what is what is the next step? Like, and this is, this is here comes prayer. You know, it's like just you know that I can know so that we can see that we can have boldness. Um, I, but boldness comes uh, most most times most often I feel like anyway boldness comes from an idea of understanding. Yes. Like when you understand what you're supposed to do, you you're given boldness. Like I'm I can do this. I'm gonna do this. I know exactly what I have to do, and now I have the boldness to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's again through communication. It's through, uh, yeah, being in communication with God and knowing exactly what He wants us to do. And when we do that, we have direction, and we can go boldly. We can go confidently. Yeah. No, I agree, and. Um you know, I, I think that's, you know, if, if you go back into Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.25, it's a very simple verse. Just brothers, pray for us. Mm. You know, that's something that I wish I had the boldness to ask people to, to pray for me. Mm. So, um the past couple weeks, I, as you know, I've been dealing with yes. um, some medical stuff, and I never asked you to pray for me, and I should have. Right. I was not bold enough to ask you, or, or I didn't even have the wherewithal to say to contact you and say, "Hey, would you pray for me?" Mm. But you stepped out. And you sought me out and said, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? What's going on? And through that, you said, okay, I got it. Now I know how to pray for you. And to me, that means everything. Hmm. Because where I'm weak, you are bold enough to step out in faith and say, I'm going to take this fight. And and that is the, the essence of fellowship as Christians. Hmm. Because not one of us is perfect, and we all are, are going to have our good times yeah. where we're strong and we're prepared. We've got the full armor on, and we're going to have our bad times where we're really struggling. And, you know, one of the darts got through, and yeah. and we're really feeling miserable, and we need someone else to help us to come and, like, put up the shield and and, and uh, help get us recovered. Um, we're all going to experience that, and that's, yeah, that's, that's what it is. But, it, like, also with that, uh, the example you gave of, of prayer— like I had that boldness because I, that was, I knew that was what God wanted me to do. Mm-hmm. I had I'd been in, you know I'd been trying <laughs> to be in communication with God. It's been something I've been convicted about a lot in the last month that I just need to be more focused on prayer and communicating yeah. with God because there's so much that He has to offer, and I'm just I I wanted to, I remember I was praying to Him uh, the one time and and uh, He just came through all of a sudden like I felt like I was praying to a wall for so long. I and, remember you saying that. Yeah. And then just suddenly he just came through and, 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 um, and I was like, God, where have you been? He was like, I, I was here the whole time. You're the one who walked away. <laughs> like, mm. like you're the one who hasn't been pursuing me. And I was like, oh, right. Yeah, of course you're right. Yeah. yeah. I I mean, and that was exactly right. And so I realized I, I was going off on my own again as usual. And, um, and I don't know why, because every time I come back to him, he's faithful. Like he's always there and he, and he gives me such great things. And, mm-hmm. you know, time back, like he, he was, he, he told me that, you know, I was, that's what I was, I was supposed to pray for you and that he was going to, he was going to do something to that. And so I did. And that's where I got yeah. my boldness from. And that, that's, that's the idea, you know, <laughs> we can, we can run around on the battlefield and do all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. We can do great things even. Like yeah. Swing our swords real hard. Yeah. <laughs> and something will come down probably. Yeah. We'll hit something <laughs> yeah. eventually, right? Um, but how much better would it be? How much more efficient of a fight would it be if we we're getting our orders directly from the general? Yeah, if it was more tactical. Yeah, and he's telling us exactly where to go and yeah. we're going exactly there and we're just really bringing down the enemy hard. Like, that's that would be my goal. Like, I don't know... Like I'm, I'm not perfect at it, obviously, but <clears throat> that's my goal. Like, I want to do the most damage. Yeah, <laughs> like, I want to do the, as much damage as possible. Hundred percent. So yeah, like and that's enter prayer. You know, being in communication with our with our God, and it's more than just. I mean, this is the battlefield application, right? You know, the analogy of the battlefield. But I mean, if you really go into it in a relational aspect, 
it's it's so foundational. Like it it is still similar. Like if you're not talking to God, then how can you know what He wants? Yeah. How do we know? I mean, we have His Word, which is great, and this is, I believe, where everyone needs to start and needs to be founded on is is His Word. But then He has the. I mean, we have the Holy Spirit, and He's there. He's given it to Him. He's given Him to us for a reason, and the reason is we we can have a deeper connection, a personal connection. Mm. I like it. Yeah. 